Well, we can read on to Romans chapter 3 again. I have intended to cover more than I am, but the Lord's not different, I guess. Romans 3, verse 19, we'll look at today. Here we've been discussing, we've been talking about the depravity of man, and how man is corrupt, and all that he does, seeks after mischief by nature. Verse 19, Paul kind of summarizes this a little bit. He says, Now we know that what things soever the law say to say to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Amen. He begins this with saying, now we know, that is, this is a thing that ought to be known, or to be common sense, what we might say. He says that whatsoever the law saith, when there's debate about what Paul means here about the, the law, some say it's the Mosaic law, we think of the law, others the entire of the Old Testament, because he's been quoting from Psalms and Isaiah. Others think the moral law because it applies to all men. As we'll see in a little bit, I think that all men outside of Christ are under the law. Amen. If you recall that Moses was given the law to the Jews, and before that men were still condemned to sin, and even after that the Gentiles were condemned, all except a handful that we see in scriptures. Man is guilty of sin, even if he hasn't been literally handed the law. So I personally would like a, a better understanding of the law and its different aspects and how it applies today. We have right, what we have what's called the moral law and the ceremonial law and you know, the dietary and cleanliness laws that the Jews were given. And there's a debate about well, should we. Still keep all the aspects of the law. That's what the Hebrew roots and Messianic Jews teach. Right. Some would say, well, if it's not repeated in the New Testament, then we don't have to worry about it. Others would say, if it's not told that it's done away with in the New Testament, then we ought to keep it. There's lots of different views on the law and how we ought to view it in our day. But for today's sake, he is saying that the law, whatsoever things the law saith, they say to them who are under the law. Right. It only applies to those to who are under its authority. For example, we're not obligated to keep the laws of Mexico, but if we go into Mexico, you can be sure you are obligated to. Mm -hmm. At least a few years ago, there was a story about a Marine who accidentally crossed over the border down there in Texas, and he was arrested because he broke some of Mexico's laws. Mm. You see, if you were under that authority, then you were guilty of whatever the law says. Amen. So the question that's debated quite a bit is what does it mean to be under the law? Who is, or who is under the law? If we turn over to Galatians, we'll see the answer to this. Galatians chapter 4. If you're familiar with the Galatian letter, they were attempting to go back under the law. And Paul was correcting them and scolding them. Chapter number four of Galatians, verses three and five. It says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth the Son made a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Amen. We came to redeem those who were under the law. He says that we were in bondage to the elements of the world. He's speaking about us, isn't he? Not just the Jews, but right. All that Christ came to say were under the law. I would conclude that all that are outside of Christ are under the law. You're right. We sang a song, Christ in me, a hope of glory. But outside of Christ, there is no hope, is there? As the song said, 
Without Christ, we I would have no saving plea. Amen. If we are not in Christ, we are under condemnation as well. We are bound, if you will, to keep the law. If we are not in Christ. You see, even the Gentiles are responsible to hold, to keep the law. Amen. So that for the unsaved and for us that were saved before the Lord saved us, we are continually condemned by the law because we continually break the law. Amen. Yet, we have Christ as our mediator, 1 Timothy 2 5 tells us, and tells us that he has redeemed us from the curse of the law, Galatians 3 13. So, yeah, outside of Christ, we are accountable to the law and guilty under the law, but yet in Christ, he has set us free. Amen. As so we'll see later in the book of Romans, we are no longer under law, but under grace. So, when we, considering our text, Whatsoever the law say that say the name we were under the law, that applies to all men who mm -hmm. are not in Christ. All who have not been saved are guilty of breaking the law. We'll go look at a few other places here in Galatians. We'll see that to be under the law means you must find justification in the law too. Mm -hmm. Galatians chapter 5 verse 4. This is exactly what the Galatians were trying to do. They were keeping the law. In verse 4, Paul says, Christ has become no effect in you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Right. That doesn't mean they were saved and then lost again, but yeah. they had left grace and went back to the law. They, they went back into that bondage, which I think it was Peter who said that neither you nor your fathers could keep, speaking to the Jews. Because if you recall, there was a great debate about if the Gentile believers should follow the whole law and be circumcised and so on. And they came to the conclusion that all the apostles said that, that they would not put a yoke of bondage about them that neither you nor your fathers could keep, but rather he just said to abstain from fornication and to abstain from blood. If you do these, you do well. Mm -hmm. See, like I said, these Messianic Jews and Hebrew roots type people, they want to say, no, we've got to keep all these things of the law, but and when you do that, you're, you're putting yourself back under the law, and that's going to be your justification. Right. As if you kept the law or if you didn't keep the law. And Christ is of no effect to you. Mm -hmm. That's why I can't believe in universal salvation because Christ is of no effect to you if you're under the law. You're right. Amen. Rather he is if he's if you're saved, he has redeemed you, purchased you from that curse from being under the law and given us his grace whereby we can serve him. Let's go back to chapter three of Galatians again, verses twenty one through twenty two. It says is the law against the promise of God? God forbid. Amen. Where Abraham was given promises as well as Isaac and Jacob. Yet the law of God did not void these promises. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, barely righteous should have been by the law. The law was insufficient in that it could bring about life Spiritual Amen. life. It was insufficient in that he could give us righteousness. But notice verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Amen. Here we see the same universality of guilt of mankind that all are under sin. But the law could not bring about real righteousness because man was guilty of breaking the law. But it can only come by faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we go back to chapter 2, verse 21, we'll see again, Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for righteousness come by the law, and Christ is dead in vain. 
The law could save, the law could justify, the law could never bring about our own righteousness, then we would have no need for Christ. Yet yeah, Christ became the righteousness for us. Amen. And he gave us his righteousness and took upon our sin on the cross. The righteousness, as far as real righteousness in the sight of God, can only come through the person of Christ. Yeah. We'll see this more as we get into the latter parts of chapter 3 in Romans, but the law in and of itself could not save you. Amen. Let's go back to our text again in Romans here. We'll continue on. Romans 3 and 19, after he says, Now we know that whatsoever things the law say, it say to them that are under law. So all those who are under the law, all those who are outside of Christ, the, the law is applicable to them, and they must keep it for otherwise they will not be justified in sight of God. Amen. The truth is they cannot keep it. That is why we have Christ. He says that every mouth may be stopped. <laughs> That is, that since all are under the law and are accountable to it, no one is going to be able to <coughs> plead ignorance of it. No one's going to be able to say, well, God, I didn't know any better. Mm. At the best, man will be able to do like Job did in Job chapter 40, verse 4. When he replies to God, he says, what shall I answer thee? I am vile, I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Right. Job couldn't reply anything to God and say he was vile. When man stands before God and all his self righteousness and all his quote good works, that's the best he'll be able to say is I am vile. That's it. Be bad. Yet all those who are outside of Christ, that's exactly how they will have to try to justify themselves by their by their righteousness, by their own righteousness, by their own good works. And yet they'll be sorely lacking when they stand before God. Amen. Every mouth may be stopped. That he says that the natural man, they do not desire no more about the law because it condemns them. As we see here in the next part of our text, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The Pharisees, they, they studied the law inside and out, but they still couldn't understand it. Right. They trusted in their own self-righteousness, and yet they, that same law that they trusted in <coughs> condemned them as guilty before God. That's why a man doesn't like to seek to truly know the law, because he, he would rather be ignorant and thinking he is okay rather than see the law for what it is and see that he is guilty before God. Mm -hmm. But the law condemns each and every one of us as guilty. Without, without seeing our real need of Christ, we will not want to go to him. Amen. Yet when we really see ourselves in the sight of God and comparison to his law, we'll see that Christ is the only remedy. 1 John 3 4 tells us sin is the transgression of the law. Amen. Just a couple verses later, verse 23 says, For all have sinned, as well as chapter 5, verse 12 tells us all have sinned, all are broke the law of God. Therefore, the whole world is guilty in the sight of God. Amen. Both through the person of Adam, we inherited that sin nature, but individually we have all broken the law of God as well. Even the best of men, even the most moral and right upstanding citizens have transgressed the law of God and therefore are guilty before them. That's not a popular teaching today. It's not something that's liked among the world that man is universally guilty before God. Right. Yet it's been the truth ever since the fall that man has been guilty. That is why Adam ran and hid in the garden because he was guilty before God. And so it has been for everyone born since then that they are guilty before God. Even Abel, as a righteous person as he was, had to make a sacrifice because he was guilty before God. Amen. 
<clears throat> and all the world may become guilty before God, he says that. The law shows us our sin. It doesn't, it was never meant to save, it was never meant to bring about our own righteousness or our own self justification, but rather it just shows us that we are sinners. And it shows us in every which way how we break the law of God. Amen. Why? Uh, I'll use one example. In traffic laws, we break them all the time, probably here. All right? There's one law that I know Clark's Williams don't follow. I don't know about y'all, but when you're pulling out of the driveway or out of business, you're not supposed to turn in the middle of the turn lane. You're supposed to go out in the traffic. Yet, my, even my myself, break that law all the time. Right. But if you didn't know that was the law, it doesn't make me any less guilty of breaking that law. You're right. Another one is you're coming up to a turn lane at a light, you're not supposed to get over in the turn lane until the little break in the line. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you every single day on Riverside Drive, that law is broken. Right. Yeah, just because you don't know that that is a law doesn't mean you're not guilty of it. Right. That's why a man doesn't want to know, though. He, he thinks. If he doesn't know more about the law, then he'll, he won't be held responsible for it. But yet man will stand guilty before God because the law has been written on the hearts of every man. You're right. Because man has been given a conscience to know right and wrong. We've seen this in our previous studies here in Romans. You know, even the Native Americans here, thousands of miles across the sea from where Moses gave the law and where the gospel was preached until a few hundred years ago, even they knew that there was a God. Amen. They knew right as far as know that He was a spirit. <coughs> but that wasn't because man has dreamed up God, that God is some invention of man. It's because we all share that common ancestor going back to Adam. Amen. All men know that there is a God deep down. That all men will stand guilty before God unless they are in Christ. Unless you trusted in Him, unless you believed in Him, for, and you will stand there in your own righteousness and your own justification, and it will be sorely laughing. We're not going to get into verse 20 today, but the next time we will, we'll see that justification cannot come by the law, but righteousness can only come through the person of Christ. Amen. Go ahead and close with that thought. <clears throat>